Um, so let's talk about independence. I had hoped that I would be able to show you a video that, but I couldn't get it to work, that talks about independence, but I'll post the video for you so when you uh, have some time you can take a look at it. But it just basically summarizes in a, a little bit more light way the um, principles of audit independence. So one of the key principles, under the responsibility principles, one of the key characteristics or, or key requirements is that the auditor is independent, right? The auditor has to be independent. They have to, you expect them to be um, independent both in fact and both in appearance, and we'll talk about that in, in, in more detail. Other things under the responsibility principles is that the auditor has to have the capabilities to perform the audit. Right? You don't want your car mechanic giving you advice about investing in a company, right? Well, maybe he you know, has his, you know, a broker's license or something and he's just fixing cars because he likes to. I don't know. Right? But generally, you're not going to go to your car mechanic to give you advice about whether or not you want to invest in a company. Right? You want to know also that if you're looking at this audit report, that the auditor who performed the work is competent, they're capable. And you want to know that they, you know, at a minimum, they went to a four-year college and got a degree in, in accounting. Okay, that they, you know, continue with continuing professional education, that they're knowledgeable about what they're doing. You want to be able to rely on that. So experience and expertise is important. And what you'll find in, when you go to public accounting firms, or even if you go to work in private industry, your learning doesn't stop, right? You always, uh, you're always going to be put in a, uh, you know, be expected to continue your professional education by attending seminars, um, uh, you know, and reading and keeping up, updated on what is happening in, in your profession and new standards and how those standards would affect your clients or your company. Uh, I'll get, talk about independence uh, in, a, in a moment. Due care. The auditor has to exercise due care in the performance of the audit. Right? So that they have to, when they make decisions, and remember I talked about the fact that a lot of auditing is judgment. It's not black and white. There are certain things that are black and white given how the accounting principles, generally accepted accounting principles, are written, right? So for example, black and white is cut off. When, if the cut off, did I ship the goods? The, uh, our year ends on 1231. Did those goods leave m your client's uh, warehouse on or before 1231? If it did, you can recognize the revenue, right? Because that's one of the, the, the criteria under revenue recognition, right? Did we ship it? And that's an indication that ownership changed hands when it's shipped, right? So that's pretty black and white. You can look at it. You have a, a definitive date. So there's no real judgment there. So anyone reasonable would expect that if they saw that something was shipped on 1231 that the revenue is valid, right? Or, or that the, you could record the revenue. But then we also have elements of generally accepted accounting principles that are highly judgmental. Think about, as I said, allowance for doubtful accounts, obsolescence reserves. Or if it's a company that has uh, financial instruments, then you have to be concerned about fair value. Um, it, you know, it's easy to determine um, the value of stock, of a company's stock that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange, right? You can go to any number of indices on websites or you know, uh, financial websites and find out what that stock is trading at, right? You go to, new, you could look it up and find out. So that's what we, in financial accounting, right? Uh, the financial accounting over that, that would be considered a level one security, right? Because you can determine what the stock price is. So a reasonable user could kind of backtrack, do exactly what you did and find out what the stock price is. But then we also have those investments that are not readily tradable, right? There's no ready market for it. So there's an element of judgment. And that goes on, a it, there is a degree. You have level twos and level threes, right? So the value, it's not observable. So there's judgment involved. So how does the auditor determine whether or not that amount is recorded at its fair value, right? 
they're going to have to rely on information that's coming from different sources, right? Whether they use a third-party expert, evaluation expert, whether they use the client's information, or whether they use their own, right? There, there's judgment involved in that. And that's where you, you want to see, obviously throughout the audit you want to have due professional care, but you, there, are a lot of, there could be a lot of things that someone coming behind the auditor, such as the PCOB, to look at their work could say, you know, that wasn't a reasonable assumption. That's not the assumption that I would make. Right? So the due professional care is extremely important. And when we talk about documentation and uh, of audit evidence, we'll talk about how important, why it's so important to document um, your audit approach and document your audit of findings and your rationale for your conclusions on particular areas, especially in those areas that are very judgmental or very subjective, right? Because you want to make sure that a reasonable user could see how you arrived at that conclusion. Even if they disagree with your conclusion, the f that they can track how you arrived at that conclusion and say, okay, well, that makes sense, but here's why I might disagree. Professional skepticism, we're going to talk about that a lot next week. Um, professional skepticism um, is kind of this, um, this, this area or that's very um, kind of vague, right? Uh, but yet it's throughout the standards. The standards and when we talk about professional skepticism, we'll talk about it more. The, the standards mention professional skepticism throughout. There's no standard that says this is the standard of professional skepticism. Instead, what you'll see is throughout the, the auditing standards, you, you'll see that there's reference made to this concept of professional skepticism. And basically, what professional skepticism in a nutshell is that auditors should have a questioning mind, right? and make a critical assessment of the evidence in front of them. So basically, you know, don't accept things blindly. You don't want to assume your clients are crooks because that's not going to go over well for you retaining that client if, if you walk in there and you think that they're crooks, right? Even if you don't think, if you don't verbalize that, your audit actions will show that, right? Because you will gather a lot of evidence, you'll talk to them, you'll, you'll question everything they do, and you might, be, you know, and you, you might not be conducting a, more, a very efficient audit, right? Which is why we get to this, the, the process of risk assessment, right? So you want to suspect, you want to have this, you want to go in and say, not assume that they're guilty, but don't also assume that your clients are, are you know, up upstanding citizens either, right? You want to have a healthy dose of skepticism. You want to question things. Right. So we'll talk more about that. Question in mind and critical assessment of the evidence. And then judgment. Right? The auditor has to be able to apply judgment. As I pointed out, I gave the example, so I won't reiterate those. But there's a lot of judgment involved in auditing. And two auditors can look at the same set of facts and come to a very different conclusion right? because of judgment. Experience is going to affect how you judge that issue or how you analyze that issue or, or the conclusion that you come up with that issue. Right? So there's a reason that you won't have first year staff accountants auditing a complex account such as fair value. Right? You're not going to have them do that because they don't have the experience and the expertise in that area that a, a senior or a manager or a partner would have to audit that. And, that. and because those areas require a lot of judgment. You want, ju you want those people who are looking at those areas or auditing those areas to bring to that their level of expertise and experience so that they can make a sound judgment. So it's the application of your training, your knowledge, and your experience and making an informed decision about the audit evidence. 